Good morning. Over the last couple of weeks, we have, well, I guess it's been the last three weeks, but two of the three weeks, we've looked at a couple of videos that deal with the topic of life. We're going to be following up on those two videos this morning with the sheet that I handed out this morning. And uh, if there are any questions that you have regarding the videos that we watched over the last three weeks, I'll give you an opportunity to ask those also. But let's begin this morning with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you today and give you thanks for your gift of life. The life that you have given to us here on earth that is the opportunity for us to come to know you as the one and only Savior and to share in the joys of eternal life for all eternity. We ask that you would help us through our study of your word to come to a greater understanding and appreciation of that gift of life and our time of grace here on this earth. That we might speak out for those who cannot speak out for themselves. That we might value life as you do. And that we might appreciate this gift that you have given to us. All this we ask in your saving name. Amen. We didn't get the video last Oh, you didn't? Because it was her. Oh. It kept going to the first, it kept the first one. The first one? And you couldn't get it to the second one. Okay. So That's to to good to know. I actually was going to ask somebody beforehand, and I was kind of distracted with a few other questions that I had. So, so okay, the video that was supposed to be last week was going to be on cloning and stem cells, which was a little bit different, but I'm glad to know that uh, this study touches on that just a little bit, but not very much. So the first study that we dealt with dealt more with where life comes from, and it dealt more specifically with the, the issue of abortion, when does life begin. The, one of the issues that comes about with stem cells, and there's a lot of discussion on stem cells right now uh, because of cancer research and other things, but what's happening is that there are, there are facilities and uh, groups of people that are creating uh, children through uh, sperm and egg and then harvesting the stem cells from that embryo and then killing off what's left and they don't see any problem with that. Uh, now there are many other ways to harvest stem cells. Um, the, the womb, uh, Dr. Menton talks about the super, super organ in the womb and the fact that there are so many rich uh, stem cells in, in that organ, there are other ways to harvest stem cells, but it's simpler for them to do it that way uh, rather than, and there are other, there are other in issues also. If, um, it's kind of an interesting thing, but if, if we were to harvest stem cells, for example, from me, those stem cells would already be a certain age. And what they found in the, the research that they've done is that a lot of times if you, for example, when, uh, do, you, do you guys remember Do uh, Dolly, the sheep that was cloned? Mm -hmm. So she was cloned, now sheep typically live to be about 12 years of age. When she was cloned, she was cloned from six-year-old stem cells. She only lived to be six years of age. And they wonder if, as a result of the fact that the stem cells that were used, the cells that were used to create her, because they were already a certain age, if that then shortened her lifespan as a result. Now, if I got stem cells that were the same age as I was, I wouldn't have any problem with that. Uh, because it's not going to shorten my life, and we don't even know for sure whether that, that actually takes place. But one of the major issues regarding stem cells is, are you creating a life to harvest stem cells to just simply cr then destroy that life as a result? That is not a God-pleasing thing. And it's a, it's, it's a really, really difficult thing with all of the, vis the uh, videos that are coming out with Planned Parenthood and the fact that they're harvesting a certain body parts from uh, babies that are aborted. I mean, this is all coming to light right now, and the same thing is going on in connection with stem cells, but people really aren't up in arms about it because it's not quite the same as a fetus that is 20 weeks along or 15 weeks along. This is simply just an egg uh, that was created that... It might only be a couple of weeks old, if that, before it, it is terminated. So that's one of the issues that that video did get into. Uh, it talks a little bit about cloning also. If you'd like to see that video, I can still make sure that that, that, that happens. But sorry that you didn't get that. Yes? I know of a patient who was treated with stem cell from an outside donor. <clears throat> and that doctor said that truly you do, you do have a new birth date. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and one of the things that you find um, when 
Sam had her stem cell transplant. She got hers from Germany. Um, it changed everything. It changed her blood type. Uh, it changed, I forget what all else your brother was telling me that it changed, but it was just amazing. You don't think about those things, but they had to completely uh, change all of the, in Germany, they don't give the uh, same vaccines that we give in the United States. And so she had to be revaccinated for all of the things that we've been vaccinated here in the United States because the stem cells that she received had not been vaccinated. So you're right, it is. Uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an extreme situation there as opposed to some of the ways in which they use stem cells. But it, it's a really, uh, I mean, it's an amazing science, but it, I think there's a lot more to it than the average person uh, even realizes as well. Yeah, so what is her new birth date? <laughs> or is it he, he, he or she? It was a a lady. A lady. Well, my sister's going to be getting her own. She will. I mean, it's an it's an amazing thing what they're able to do with it. And and if it, it may it may happen that some of you might be in a situation like some of the people that you're aware of, and and that's just probably a really good question to ask up front because one of the things that they offer now is something to do with stem cells uh, when it comes to cancer or anything else, and it's just a good question to ask where are those stem cells going to come from, uh, where are you going to get them from. Uh, they should be upfront and honest about it, but to say, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable uh, if we're getting those stem cells from a child that has been created just to harvest those stem cells and then is simply thrown away. At the end, and there are many, uh, it's probably the percentage, you might know more than I do, but it seems like the percentage of those is still small in comparison to the adult stem cells. There's tons of um, companies yeah, yeah. that are willing to donate their yep. stem cells to yep. treatment. Yep. And, and that you realize we we offered and they the family and they said no. Right. Right. And that's and they, the sisters didn't match. Either. Right. And and sometimes you go through that and you find that they you don't match and there's if you can't do it yourself so they, yeah. If they match. Yeah. Yeah. Not if they don't match. Yeah. Well, there are other complications that come in in connection with that too sometimes uh, because of how Pastor, close they are. Pastor Fleischer was saying Pastor Sandines were from umbilical cords. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's part of that. I mean, it's amazing all of the 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 richness of the cells that are in this, the cord and the placenta and all of that stuff. It's just amazing. So this, this study here is a little bit more broad. I wanted to kind of go through, and this is going to relate, this is kind of like a review of the fifth commandment. Uh, as I was putting this together last night, I was thinking a little bit about that. Um, but what we're going to do is there, there are six main parts if you go through the sheet. Uh, God gives and takes life. Human life is special. God forbids murder. Then on the back side, we have examples from scripture. What about abortion and mercy death? And then the last one is, why is this so important? So we might take a lot of this for granted, but let's start with the first section, God gives and takes life. Uh, I need a volunteer for Deuteronomy 32, 39, and another volunteer for Psalm 31, 15. Now see that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there anyone who can deliver me or deliver from my hand. All right, so what is the, what is the main part of that verse that we're considering here? How is it, this applicable to life? God says, I kill and I make life. Okay, God says, hey, life is in my hands, doesn't he? He says, I kill, I make alive. There are many other passages that we can think of in, in uh, Acts chapter 17. I was thinking of that reference also when... When the Apostle Paul was reasoning with the Greeks in Athens, he said that our God has our pre-appointed times laid out for us, that he knows what is the beginning of our time and the end of our time. Uh, God has that all <coughs> laid out. Our time, our life, is in his hands. He is the one who has the... And if you think about it, you know, I talk, I talk with my children about, about this all the time. When, when there's something that they get into, I said, whose was that? I'll say, it was yours. Well, who has, you know, if, if you want to borrow that, then you come and you, you ask me, I, who bought it? You did. All right, well, if I purchased it, it's mine. If you want to borrow it, if you want to use it, that's fine, but come and ask me. That's, that's my responsibility to loan that out or take it back to take care of it, unless I give that responsibility to you. And God is the same way. Since God is the one who creates life to begin with, 
he is the one who is responsible for that life, both in the beginning and in the end. Now, we're going to see later on that there are times where God gives that responsibility. He, he loans that responsibility to someone else. Uh, it's the exception to the rule. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The next passage, Psalm 31. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Hmm. I don't think that's it. <laughs> that's a good passage, though. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Okay, so my times are in your hand. And in this case, you'll notice what, what, who's the, who is the writer, the holy writer here in Psalm 31? It sounds like him, doesn't it? If you go back to the beginning of the chapter, it says a Psalm of David. Uh, David had all kinds of times where people were trying to chase him down. Saul, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, Absalom, his own son, was trying to chase him down. And so he says, my times are in your hands, Lord. Deliver me. Protect me. Uh, you're the one who's in charge of my life, both the good, giving life, and taking life. Uh, be with me. Protect me. So this is kind of the foundation when we talk about God's gift of life, that God is the one who gives life. So it is he that is in charge of also taking life. Uh, it is not ours to take. It is his to take in his good time. The second section, human life is special. There are three categories that we have there. Human life, animal life, and plant life. If you look at your science textbooks, they will make those three main categories. Actually, they don't divide it into three categories. They will put it all into one category. Uh, all life is the same. And that's one of the problems that we have as a result of uh, the concept of evolution in our world is that it equates all life. In fact, it doesn't even equate all life. It'll say uh, plant life, animal life, and human life is down here. So it flips the things around. Instead of human life being here, and then animal life, and then plant life, it wants to invert the order that God has established. Now I want to start at the bottom with plant life. You'll notice I have a little uh, explanation there. The Bible never uses the word life to describe plants. There are all kinds of passages in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, that speak about their life is in their blood, dealing with animals. It says that God, uh, he made the living things, speaking about animals. That phrase is never used of, of plants. So we talk about, you know, the fact that trees are, are living things, that the grass is living, that the flowers are living. They, they rise up and then they die off. But the Bible never refers to plants as living things. And this is really important, especially when you go back to the very creation. Some people have asked the question, well, if plants are living things, how could God have allowed them to kill them and eat them? Because in God's eyes, plants aren't living things in the same way that animals are. And that's why when God gave the garden into the hands of Adam and Eve, he says, you can eat of all the plants, the fruits, but not the animals. They were living things in the eyes of God. The plants were not. It wasn't until after the flood that God gave permission to human beings to eat animals, other, this lower category of life. What I'd like to do is I'd like to look at Genesis chapter 2. And I might, actually it says 1 and 2, I'd like to back up just a little bit into Genesis chapter 1. I have down there three differences, Genesis 1 and 2, three differences. I want to lay out three differences between animal life and human life. Does anybody want to guess what the three differences are? Okay, uh, I don't like to use that because there are certain passages in the Bible that actually use the same Hebrew word in connection with animals. They say that animals have a nephesh or a soul also. Now, we use that word in a little different sense, and you're, and you're right. There is a distinction between animals and humans, but I don't think that word is, in the Hebrew at least, is the one that makes that distinction. Okay, number one is that human beings were created in the image of God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. A volunteer. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. 
let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and other over other over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay, so there's what Wade mentioned, the fact that God created mankind in his own image. And if you back up to verses 20 to 23, which deals with the fish and the birds, you don't see that. And if you go to verses 25, 24 and 25, God says, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth after their, after their kind, and it was so. So one of the unique features about human beings was that they were created in the image of God. That they had a, a relationship with God. They knew God perfectly. They knew what was right, what was wrong. Uh, God had this relationship with them. Uh, they were holy. They were perfect. This verse, the verse that Ron just read, gives us also number two. What was the, uh, what's, the, what's the second thing that that verse tells us about the distinction between human beings and animals? Yes, what did he say to Adam and Eve? He says, I want you to have dominion over all of the other animals. Adam and Eve were the crown of God's creation. Into their hands, God entrusted the responsibility to take care of the rest of life that God had created, the animal life. So they were to have dominion. They were to rule over the rest of God's creation. Third thing, they were created in the image of God. They were given dominion over all things. Anybody remember what the th a third thing would be? Let's go to the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 7. What's that? Okay, it's kind of interesting. Um, the Bible there tells us that he formed Adam. You know, you can, you can actually see God here down and playing in the dirt. And he forms, kind of like a, if you've ever been on the beach, you know, and you play and you form sandcastles or whatever. Have you ever seen some of these sand uh, images that people make on the beach? I mean, they're just beautiful. And here's God. And he's forming this image of this man out of the dirt. But what else did he do? Yes. After he forms this, this being in the, in the dirt of the earth, he gets down on his knees and he breathes into his mouth the breath of life. And the dirt became a living being. Now, what's interesting about this is the way in which God went about it. When, when God created the birds, do you see, do you see God sitting down cross-legged on the beach and, and, and making, you know, an eagle and a, and a robin? No. Do you see him forming an alligator and breathing into its nostrils the breath of life? No. It's an intimate relationship, isn't it? God snaps his fingers and the birds are there. He snaps his fingers and the, the reptiles are there and the, the land animals are there. But with man, he sits down and individually forms Adam and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. So there's this intimate relationship between Adam and then later Eve. You remember how Eve was created a couple of verses later on. He put Adam to sleep like a good doctor would removes his rib and fashions out of that rib another human being and brings her then to Adam. So a beautiful relationship. So the three things there formed in the image of God, given dominion over the rest of creation, the other living things, and an intimate relationship. God forming Adam, breathing into the, the, their, their nostrils the breath of life. They became a living being. So very, very distinct and different ways of God relating to these forms of life. When we take a look at the order of creation, we have human beings at the top, then animals, and plant life isn't even on the it's not even on the chart as far as God is concerned. We, we see that they, they are alive in a sense, but not in the same sense that God has created both animals and also human beings. So this is very important. It, there's a difference. Our, our world today says, hey, let's not go out and kill the spotted owls. Let's, let's protect them and let's kill babies. You can see this inverted uh, way of looking at the importance in which God has laid out. 
I don't know if you heard this. Um, a number of years ago when I was in Atlanta, there was, uh, there was a big issue. You're all familiar with PETA, right? PETA? Uh, so they were all upset because they thought it was inhumane to milk cows for milk and dairy and ice cream and things like that. So their solution was, let's milk human beings and use that for ice cream. I, and Ben and Jerry's, one of the, they were actually looking into doing that kind of thing. Now, th there's the inverted idea of, of what, what God has done. It says, this is the way it is. And our world wants to flip that upside down and say, oh, human beings aren't really as important as, as, as animals are. We want to elevate the importance of that. We have to remember that it is important to care for the creation, that we should be concerned about the spotted owls and the bald eagles and everything else, but that those things aren't above the concern for human beings. Uh, in, in Atlanta, a number of years ago when they had the drought, uh, I mean, there's six million people in the Atlanta area, and all of that is fed by Lake Lanier. Well, Lake Lanier was a dammed up river, the Chattahoochee, and it was so low that you could see the farms that had been buried for 30, however many years it was since they dammed up the river. Uh, you could see roads that hadn't existed for 30 years. And the water level was getting drastically low. And there were, there were environmentalists that came out and they said, you got to let water out of the dam because all of the mussels in the river are going to die. They were more concerned about the mussels in the river that might die because of the change in the environment than they were the six million human beings in the city of Atlanta that weren't going to have drinking water as a result. And those are, we find those examples all over the world around us that there's this, this flip-flop of the importance of God's creation. Any thoughts? Human life is special. Does God care for animals the way he cares for us? Absolutely. If you take a look, uh, there are a number of Psalms. And Job, uh, the, some of the uh, book of Job deals with the fact that God cares for all of these living animals as well. Uh, so there, uh, Psalm 139 would be, I think it's Psalm, no, it's not Psalm 139. Uh, I have to look up my reference. So Psalm 139 deals with life, but human life. There's another one that deals with animals. And Ginny? you testify that God takes care of animals as well as us because my animals out in the desert, my cats and dogs sometimes get hit by rattlesnakes. And I pray to the Lord to help them because I love them. And he, he I leave it in his hands, but he's saved my cat, and cats usually don't survive. He, he's concerned about all, I mean, and, and we can go down another step beyond that too. I mean, he's concerned about the, the nature, the earth around us as well. Uh, when you talk about flooding and hurricanes and things like that, natural disasters, God is concerned about the very earth itself. But that isn't the most important thing to him. Uh, animals aren't the most important thing to him. First, and of most, and that goes back to the point that Lisa made earlier, that, that human beings are created with a soul. We are able to have a relationship with God that animals and, and other things in the world around us are not. And so God is concerned first and foremost about us. But it doesn't mean that he's not concerned about everything else in the creation. He knows I'd feel better if I had them. <laughs> sure. Sometimes he's sympathetic more toward us than he is maybe even the animals. But any other thoughts? Human life. It's amazing. <laughs> so where is the reference that, that you said to me so that, that in Hebrew? Nefesh? Yeah. That's in Genesis also. Um, I'd have to look up the reference. It's been a long time. It's been a long time since I did a study on that word. But the word nefesh is the word that's often translated soul or spirit. But it isn't just for human beings. There are several places in the Old Testament where it also refers to animals having the spirit. And I think that the way that the Hebrew mind understood it is it understood it in the sense of life. Not in the sense of soul in which we have attributed to it. That we talk about ourselves having a soul. Sometimes it's translated soul. But the, it looks to me like the Hebrew mind recognized more as the, the life force. Uh, inside that God gave it life, the ability to operate, and that's the way in which it's understood. In that sense, animals and human beings are, are similar. They both have this life force that allows them to function, to reason, you know, to do all these different things. But it's different than, than the idea that, that Lisa was bringing up where we have a soul. That's true also, but it's not the same Hebrew word. It's not, I don't know that the Hebrew actually 
brings out that distinction between human beings and animals. And that's why I like to go back to these three things. Because these three things are very clear distinctions between human life and animal life. And that's something that we can, you know, we can put our finger on and say, see, here's a difference between them as opposed to talking about this Hebrew word that we really can't understand all the time or when we call it, we call it the soul. Any other thoughts? All right, let's talk a little bit about murder. Uh, God forbids murder, Matthew 15, 19. Jesus himself, what does he say? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. Why don't you go on to the next verse also, Leanne? These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So if we were to just read verse 19, we'd be in a little bit of trouble because Jesus actually doesn't say that murders are bad in verse 19, right? It's verse 20 where he says these are unclean things. These are impure. This is, not, this is what defiles a human being. This is not a good thing. If we need a little bit more a solid of a Bible verse that says murder is a bad thing, let's go to the next reference, Galatians chapter 5. This one is very clear. Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitions, dissensions, heresies. And it goes on. Why don't you go on verse 21 also? Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you have murders in verse 21. Is that where it, where it is? Yes. Uh, what's interesting about this verse is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on, was, is that if you go back to verse 20, he includes in there, and what's interesting is the end of that verse, verse 21. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But he doesn't just deal with murders. If you back up, he says outbursts of anger, uh, disagreements. If those things are, are done out of hatred on the inside, those separate us from God as well. It's not just the act of committing murder that separates us from God. Uh, there are other things that also relate to the fifth commandment, hatred, uh, anger, that also separates us from God. But again, this is very clear. Paul says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, this is something that separates us from God. This is why we call it sin. It is missing the mark that God has laid out. He says, this is where I want you to hit the target, and we miss it. We don't do what God wants us to do. This is one of those passages that makes you think, how can I ever be? It does. You know. but, but if you go down, well, then you go on, uh, look at verse 24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So Paul brings it back to, I mean, this, this is all sanctification right here. So if you take this section out of its context, this is what Paul says, this is a way a Christian should live. And you're right. You look at that and you think, I can't do that. I don't do that. But he again takes it back to Christ. He's already taken it back to Christ earlier on in this letter, and he'll come back to Christ later on. Uh, to show us that Christ has redeemed us from the sin that we are not able to, we're not, the relationship that we're not able to have with God and our fellow human beings. Any thoughts on those two references? Like Emily said, uh, when you read that, it's like check, check, and check. Right. Or checkmate, <laughs> yeah, yeah. depending on how you look at it. Right. Uh, it's not a, it, I mean, it, it's, we, we all fail. Yeah. And we have the tendency, you know, the devil causes the old, human nature in us to say, hey, look at how bad everybody else is. You know, but when you read this passage, uh, those four fingers, my, my dad always said, you know, when you're pointing the finger at somebody else, you have three po fingers pointing back. Uh, and, and that's the way this verse is, isn't it? It says, hey, you can't get around this. You might think nobody else can get around it. You can't get around this. You failed. Now, when we talk about um, God forbids murder, we have these two references. I have in the next section, 
there's an exception to the rule. What's the exception to the rule? God forbids murder. Okay, capital punishment. One of the biggest questions that I get when I talk to people, well, if God forbids murder, then why are you supporting the death penalty? So let's back up to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 9. Yes. Yep. Did you say in your translation the term murder? Verse 21. I don't have it in my translation. I don't either. Yeah. They had, it's, an in, it's inserted in the, the um, King James. No. no. It's actually in the Greek. But uh, some, of the, some of the, for example, your and my tra Bible translation are based on a different set of Greek manuscripts. And some of those Greek, Greek manuscripts leave that word out of the list. Uh, there are other places we could go. We could go to 1 Corinthians 6, which also includes murder in the list. But this verse, I actually forgot that the NIV left out this verse. As I was looking at it, I remembered that it was, it was not in my list, but I forgot you had the NIV. But it is in there in, in, in a lot of the Greek manuscripts. Do you want to look at 1 Corinthians just in case? Make sure that the NIV has it there. It's in verse 21. There are, <clears throat> there are 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. So this, this kind of gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit about textual criticism. In, in the days of, of the early New Testament church, they didn't have photocopiers. Okay? So we take this sheet that we have here in front of us. If we were in the days of, of the first century AD, I would be the scribe. You would each have a sheet of paper and a pencil. And I would read, God's gift of life. And you would write, God's gift of life. And we would do that with this entire sheet. Imagine doing that with the book of Galatians. Now, what's going to happen? Differences. Dave's going to miss a word because he was writing it a little bit slower. And, and Brandon, Brandon's going to miss a, a word because he was paying attention to Holly. <laughs> so what's going to happen is as you have these, these, all these Greek manuscripts, when we turn in, we have 4, 8, 12, 16, 16 people in here. We turn in 16 manuscripts. And there's going to be some differences among those 16 manuscripts. So what happens is as then, all right, so I get Dave's manuscript. Everybody turns in their manuscript. I take these manuscripts. Oh, I lose the manuscript that I have. So I grab Dave's manuscript. And the next class comes in here, and I'm reading Dave's manuscript, which is missing that one word. And that gets transmitted then into 16 more manuscripts with the word missing. So what we do in our, in our study of textual criticism is we put all of these 6,000 manuscripts together in order to figure out uh, what is the, the actual original manuscript, what did it have. It's an interesting study all by itself, but that gives an example of why you'll have some Bible translations that favor one group of manuscripts that would be, fav we'll call them Dave's manuscript, because a lot of his manuscripts were out there. Well, his are going to be missing that one word. If we go to Brandon's manuscripts, his is going to be missing a different word. But if we go up here to Grant's manuscript, his is going to have all of them in there. And so it's kind of an interesting study to see why. And typically, if a word is missing, you have to ask yourself, did somebody insert the word? You know, and maybe Emily does that. She says, you know, I really think this is a really good list, but we really ought to add this in here. So she adds a word in there. And how do you know which one is the real one? Well, there, there's, there's a study. It's a study in and of itself. It took me a whole year to go through that study. But the, the simplest reading is usually the best. You ask yourself, would, does this make sense that somebody could have added in here? Or does it make more sense that somebody would have dropped it out? And then you also study how widespread those are. Part of the problem with the NIV and, and my NASB is that they favor two main manuscripts because they have the entire Bible included in them, whereas a lot of the manuscripts only contain part of the Bible. And so they put a little bit extra emphasis on that, even though the reading with that word missing is less widespread than the other Greek manuscripts. So there's probably 4,500 manuscripts that include the word, and maybe only, it might, might even be less than that, there might only be like 10 manuscripts that actually have that word missing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually go back and look at the word in the Greek to see how many manuscripts are on both sides, but it is kind of an interesting, an interesting study. And a lot of times critics will want to make, they want to minimize the importance of the Bible by saying, look at all the errors in the Bible, look at this example. 
of all of the, the, the differences in the Bible, all of the differences fall into less than 1%. And of all of those differences, as we sort them all out, the ones that we really can't be sure one way or the other are less than 0.01%. So it's a, it's a minute number. The fact that we've had this conversation once in a year, or maybe, <laughs> maybe 30 years, uh, is probably just evidence of that very thing. And basically, the Bible is still the same. It's just a word here and there. Correct. The truth still The is. truth is there. The fact that that word murder is included in one list and not the other doesn't change the section, does it? That's right. I mean, there are plenty of other passages that we can go to that put murder in that category, so it doesn't change the doctrine at all. All right, so the exception to the rule, Genesis 9. Okay, so here God. This kind of takes us back to the fourth commandment. What's the fourth commandment? Okay, honor your father and mother. What does the fourth commandment have to do with this? You say, I have no idea. I have no idea. The fourth commandment deals with authority. God has given his authority to parents. He's also given his authority to give and take life to the government in certain cases. Uh, the other reference that we have there is Romans chapter 13, 4, which is where Paul says that the, the government does not bear the sword in vain. If you do something wrong, you should be afraid. Because the, now, I, I tell my kids, what is a sword for? I mean, if, I, if, if, my, if my son did something and I, and I, and I pulled out my sword, You're gonna get some. is he, is he going to be afraid? Yes. Yeah. I'm not going to say, okay, turn over let me spank you with it. <laughs> That's not what a sword is for, is it? I'm not going to pull out my sword. The sword is for death. It is a weapon that is used to put people to death. Paul doesn't, he doesn't use this, this, this example just by chance. There's a specific reason why the Holy Spirit caused Paul to use the example of the sword. The government does not bear the sword in vain. You don't God, actually use your sword. With your I hands, do not. Do I don't have a sword, but it, it's a really good illustration. It makes the point. The, the government has been entrusted the responsibility of taking life. Going all the way back to Genesis at the time of the flood, God says, if man sheds blood by man, God's authority their blood will be shed. So this, these verses, Genesis 9 and uh, Romans 13, deal with the fact that God gives the right to the government to carry out death, death sentence, whether it be by capital punishment or possibly by war, uh, going to war in order to protect its people, to put other people to death, in order to preserve the lives of others. Now you'll notice on the sheet I have an exception to the exception. There's always oh. those. There are always those. Why? This is confusing. Somebody wanted to make it more confusing. Okay, what about Herod? How was Herod? Well, who was Herod? There were a couple of Herods. Yeah. When he had all the, the babes killed. Okay, that would be one example. Okay, that would be one example. That wasn't the Herod I had in mind, but that's another good example. Okay, you say the government has the right to kill people. Did Herod have the right to go into Bethlehem and slaughter all of the children? No. no. What was that? Murder. That was murder. Because he was abusing his power to protect himself. He wasn't carrying out judgment and justice using his authority, his power in order to protect his people. He was trying to protect himself. And in those cases, God holds those rulers responsible for murder. Now, the Herod that I had in mind was the Herod that John. that beheaded John. John, John the Baptist. Uh, that, that said, hey, now again, he didn't want to behead John, but his wife talked him in, well, his stepdaughter talked him into it. She said, oh yeah, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And, John, and John, Herod went through with it, didn't he? Now, was that, was that the right thing to do? Did he have the authority, the right to do that? He did not. So there are times 
where a person has the authority, God has given them authority, but they abuse that authority and they use it for something that is not good, not God-pleasing, that is just as sinful as if you didn't have that authority at all, as if I would commit murder. And God would hold that person accountable just as he would hold me accountable. Well, that's really a fine line for you know, world leaders. I mean, we see the abuse that so many of them do to their own people, but you look at why we go to war and it's been questioned in the past. Sure. And, you know, it, it doesn't give them the ability to just go to war to kill anybody. It, it does not. a legitimate reason that they can actually prove is pretty difficult. Well, and you know, with, in connection with the 9-11 the and all the work that's over going on in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and all that other stuff, I mean, that's right. People have debated that. And you know what? The people who made those decisions will give an answer to the Lord on the last day. Whether they hid that information in order for selfish reasons to go to war, or if they really did think that there was a reason that was, that was uh, hindering or endangering the American people, they will have to give an answer to that. It doesn't matter whether we figure it out or not, does it? In the end, God knows what was in the heart of those people, and he will hold them accountable for those things. Yes, Leah? Leah had an example. I thought? <laughs> uh, an example? She didn't want to share. No, I'm not saying she didn't want to share, but the father that, you know, David instigated a murder. Mm -hmm. He was the line that carried the line of yep. ancestry of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Always been hard for me. Well, um, he's the... He's on the list on the next page, examples from scripture number three, Second Samuel. And you know what's interesting, uh, for those of you who were in, in our Advent series or, um, for last year, we went through the genealogy of Jesus. And one of the things that I pointed out is that Jesus' Jesus's family tree was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And yet, what you see there with the mistakes that David... David is called a man after the Lord's own heart. And yet, look at all of the things, all the mistakes that he made. Those mistakes are there for our benefit. It's kind of like what Ron mentioned earlier. If we were to read these verses in Galatians, we'd say, boy, I, I'm, I'm a miserable, lost, condemned sinner. Can you imagine if I encourage you to read your Bibles and there were every person from Adam all the way to John, if every single one of them was a spit and polished image in the Bible that never made a mistake? Do you think you'd want to read the Bible? Mm -hmm. How do you think that'd make you feel? You'd feel lousy, wouldn't you? You'd, I don't want to read this thing. It makes me feel horrible. E to an even worse degree than the law already does. But those, those images are there to help us see God cares for, he loves sinners, just like David, who made stupid mistakes just like I make stupid mistakes. And so I think that's really valuable that even the line of Jesus, they weren't perfect. They weren't any more perfect than you and I are perfect. God used them in the same way that he uses us today in order to carry out his purposes in a different way. It's not the line of the Savior, but in other ways he still uses us to carry out his word to the people around us. So I think that's kind of a neat thing. So were there two King Davids or is it the same King David that tried to kill Jesus, or king, king Herod that tried to kill Jesus versus... Two different Herods. There were, there were about three or four different Herods, but the one that killed the babies in Matthew was a different Herod than the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. That was his, that was his son, if I remember. It was Herod Antipas. Um, Herod the Great was the one at the time of uh, Jesus as a child. And it was Herod Antipas, I believe, that was the one who killed John the Baptist. There are a couple of other Herods that are mentioned also. Uh, in the book of Acts, there's the Herod that killed the apostle James. And that's a different Herod also. They were all messed up. I mean, every single one of those Herods was a bad, bad guy. Uh, that is about it for today. So we got to the exception of, for the rule. Next week, we don't have Bible class. We are in Nuong for Mission Festival next week. So we will pick this up in two weeks, the first Sunday in November. On my list, I have uh, two things for the after we're done with this one. Um, I'm either going to take up the study on prayer or on uh, transgenders and related to homosexuality, which is a big and hot topic right now. Uh, so one of those two will be our next one on the list. The other one will be afterwards. So I'll try to announce those in the bulletin so that you know what to expect and when. Yeah. Any thoughts? The reference, the reference, I finally said murders in the Revelation. In Revelation? 
Uh, there, there's a couple of them. First Corinthians chapter 6 also has it in its list. Uh, I forget what the verses are. 9 to 11, I think. So it's in there also. Yep. Anything else before we close? We close then with the blessing of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.